You may know the story of Ishi, the last wild Indian in North America. His tribe was almost entirely wiped out by white vigilantes. A very small remnant lived on, hidden away in a very tiny area of what used to be a much larger piece of their territory. And finally there was only Ishi left. And he did something very strange. He went out and sat down in a ranch, one of the white man's ranches. But instead of killing him, they took him in, and eventually some anthropologists from Berkeley found out about him and brought him into Berkeley. And he lived there for the last four years of his life, making new friends, learning about modern civilization. teaching other people his crafts. And reading about him, in many cases I was reminded of John Fuang, his reserve, his quiet dignity. Toward the end of the book, one of the anthropologists who worked with him is asked by the author, who is his wife, what was his predominant character trait? And the anthropologist said he was patient. Not just patient, he had mastered the philosophy of patience. Then he explained what he meant by that. He said that even though Isha had suffered many hardships, faced many challenges, there wasn't the slightest trace of self-pity or bitterness in his character. Instead, there was what he, the anthropologist called an enduring cheerfulness. That you never let the difficulties get you down. And you find that you can bear with them. All too often when we think of patience, we think about how hard it is to bear with things. But the meaning of patience is that you are able to bear with them, and they don't make you crack. They don't get you anxious. You keep finding inner reserves to maintain your enduring cheerfulness. Because after all, things are going to get better. They're not going to get better because you let yourself get down. And even though situations may seem hopeless, it doesn't help if you let yourself get down, get discouraged. So keep that in mind as you practice. Whatever difficulties you're facing, either because of the quarantine or the pandemic, the heat, your mind's unwillingness to settle down, try to push the whole thing with good humor. Exasperation doesn't help. Self-pity doesn't help. Bitterness doesn't help. Try to find some positive strengths and keep them going. Because when we leave this life, what do we take with us? We take with us the state of our minds. So we want to make sure that regardless of what happens, it doesn't affect the state of our minds. So look inside you. What potentials do you have for cheerfulness? You can look for the humor in almost any situation. Not the kind of humor where you laugh at people. But where you laugh in a good-natured way. 
You see the ironies of life. And you're able to step back from them and not feel so totally wound up in them. After all, it's when you step back that you see the ironies. As the Greeks used to say, it's the gods who laugh. The gods see human beings so upset about human events, but the gods are a certain remove. And so they don't suffer. Now, the remove doesn't mean you don't care. You do care. But you look at things in terms of the long term. There are going to be temporary setbacks. And that's part of human life. We live in a realm of mixed karma. If you had nothing but good karma, you wouldn't be here. So you have to accept the fact that you've got a mixed bag. And so when you reach into the bag and you pull out this something that bites you, you toss it away, reach in again, maybe there's something good at this time. You don't let, let the fact that something has bitten you sour you on the entire bag. All those years I was in Thailand, when I came back, people would ask, what was the most difficult thing that you had to endure over there? And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I couldn't think of any one thing in particular. There were difficulties, there were hardships, but there wasn't any one thing that stood out. And then I began to realize, well, that was why I was able to deal with all the different hardships. I didn't get fixated on any of them. I didn't make them bigger than they had to be. And part of the source of that strength was I was engaged in an exploration, learning about the breath, learning about the mind. We have been meditating for a long time and tend to forget how precious this opportunity is, how rare it is, and what a good opportunity it is. You may have decided you don't like your mind. Well, it doesn't have to stay the way it is. There are things you can change. After all, as the Buddha said, if people couldn't change their minds, if they couldn't develop skillful qualities and abandon unskillful qualities, there would have been no point in his teaching. But he did teach, which is a sign that the mind is capable of that kind of change. It can change for the better. And so that's the nature of hope in the practice. Not that you hope things are going to get better, hope things are going to come your way. But you hope that by working on skillful qualities, you'll get more and more skillful. Perhaps hope is not quite the right word, but it's a confidence. that this is something you can do. You'll benefit, the people around you will benefit, so it's worth doing. That right there should be a cause enough for cheerfulness. That and the realization that human life is so hard as it is, why add extra burdens, either to yourself or to other people? If you keep piling burdens on yourself, you start resenting other people who are happy, and you end up making them miserable too. It doesn't accomplish anything. Work on 
lifting your own burdens off your own mind. And we have the opportunity to do it here. And as you get lighter, you'll be able to lighten other people's loads as well. And you'll find that that attitude of enduring cheerfulness is easier and easier to manage. And that it's a lasting gift. <laughs>